everybody, welcome back to Brombird News. Are you growing any bee balm plants? This is my second year with this one and I'm in love with it. Uh, bees are all over it, hummingbirds are all over it and it's just so pretty. All right, let's talk about grackles. They are everywhere now, and some of you have asked me how to deal with them. Well, things that I've done in the past that worked for me were removing perches completely from my feeders and switching to safflower seeds. The only problem with safflower seeds I found is that woodpeckers, nuthatches, and goldfinches are not too crazy about that. So if you just leave uh, safflower seeds, you won't see those birds uh, at all. So uh, last year, my husband and I actually watched grackles for quite a while and we decided that we were not going to fight them anymore. We actually let them feed, but we tried to restrain how much or where they eat and I'll tell you how we're doing it. So uh, first of all, we've set up several feeding stations. So I have a feeder in the front, I have my big feeding station and then we have random feeders all over the place. So that way all the birds have an opportunity to eat and we can watch them uh, in different areas. Uh, then black oil sunflower seeds, we buy in them in bulk so it's not as expensive and that's the only type of seed we give to grackles. Another thing we notice is that because we don't use pesticides or chemicals and we don't cut our grass as often, grackles just like other birds go for natural food apart from seeds. So they are always foraging for things. We see them in our trees, we see them in our gardens, my flower gardens, vegetable gardens. They're always picking all sorts of bugs, which is actually great for us because then our backyard is a lot more enjoyable and we're not swarmed with lots of bugs. Another thing that we notice is that grackles seem to come and go. They seem to have a schedule. They're not always on the feeders. Again, they, they come, they eat for a little bit and then they go off to do something else. So that's what we're doing. More bird feeders, cheaper uh, bird seed and just all birds are welcome in our backyard. But if you can't stand them, if they're just too much, again, remove the perches from your bird feeders and switch to safflower seeds. Madeline from Montreal lives in a neighborhood that has a lot of mature maple trees. A while ago, she watched a murder of crows dive bombing what looked like an empty squirrel nest. So she's curious what they were up to. Hi Madeline, you were wondering why small flocks of American crows were deliberately attacking and tearing apart leafy squirrels nests known as drays on your street on a wintry day in January in Montreal. You know, it's hard to get inside the brains of crows. They're not only among the most intelligent birds on the planet, but they're also highly social. I do know they're very opportunistic and perhaps these particular birds were looking for baby squirrels to eat. That certainly was my initial thought but you feel it was a bit early to find young squirrels in the nest at the time of the invasion, that is January. But according to the internet, there are two breeding seasons for the eastern gray squirrel in a year. One season starts from December to February, and the second is sometime around May to late June. But as you say, the gestation period of the squirrels lasts 38 to 46 days. So there likely weren't kits in the drays at that time. While crows and squirrels certainly do not like one another, and likely even occasionally include each other's young in their respective diets, I seriously doubt that it was revenge against squirrels eating their eggs or young due to the time of year. On the other hand, by destroying the squirrel's nest at such a crucial time for producing young, the crows could be lessening competition for the future. Are they that devious? Who knows? Two other possibilities are that the crows were looking to catch an adult squirrel unawares, or less likely looking for stored food in the drays. A quick follow-up from Susan Rog here and her pineapples. She's actually harvested one. Check this out.
Today, as I was putting my makeup on for you, I realized that I haven't really talked about skincare products in our environment. So years ago, I decided to switch to natural, eco-friendly skincare products. It wasn't that easy to find them. Uh, some of them actually were brought from Europe and they were a bit pricey. Uh, thankfully, more companies are now making natural skincare products. I buy my makeup actually from a company in Saskatchewan. And for our shampoos, conditioners, body lotions and washing detergents, we actually go to a local store and we refill the same containers over and over. All the products are made locally from natural ingredients. So my challenge for you is to check out what you're using and consider switching to natural eco-friendly skincare products because not only are they healthier for you, they're also healthier for the environment. You know, when it comes to longevity in the world of wild birds, one generally thinks of albatrosses as holding the records for the oldest living birds in the world. Wisdom, a Laison albatross and the world's oldest known wild bird, immediately comes to mind. She just hatched a chick at the age of at least 70 this past February. But those birds also live and breed in remote regions in the world, far from the influences of humans. Don't get me wrong, they certainly have their fair share of threats to their lives from us, longline fisheries being one of the most significant. But we really have to be impressed with an amazing pair of common loons celebrating their silver anniversary in the Seni National Wildlife Refuge in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. This year, the male marked his 34th birthday. His partner named Faye, partly after the Spanish word from faith, was banded as an adult and thus is at least 35. We know this because both birds sport alunum uniquely numbered leg bands. The male, who's known as ABJ, it means adult banded juvenile, was one of three chicks banded in 1987 in that same refuge. And he's returned there to breed every year since then. That's what loons do. Together they've raised 29 young. What makes this so newsworthy is that for common loons to live this long and breed so successfully, they must overcome many dangers. Toxic mercury from natural and human-based sources, lead poisoning from lost fishing gear, lake acidification, reduced fish populations, and disturbance during the breeding season from humans competing for use of the habitat. And during migration, they face even more threats, um, including severe weather systems caused by climate warming during their 3,000 mile migration to winter off the coast of Florida, and then their return back home. Both birds managed to survive a botulism outbreak in the refuge in 2006 and 2012, which claimed the lives of a goodly number of loons. It'll be interesting to see how many more birthdays this incredible pair of birds enjoy in the refuge. Let's keep our fingers crossed. The green peafowl or peacocks have been in steep decline in Southeast Asia. An estimated 16% of the population remains in Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia and Thailand. The thing is, when a male engages in a mating dance, he chooses a farm field just on the outskirts of the forest. But when the female sees uh, the dance, she actually goes with the free food on the field rather than paying attention to the male. And even though the birds have been declining there, they're not really protected. So when farmers see what the females are doing to their crops, they naturally go for the birds. And then with more land being cleared for farming, things are not really looking so good for the green peafowl. However, not all hope is lost and a thriving population of these birds has just been discovered in a protected area in northern Thailand. Uh, scientists still don't know how many birds are living in that area, but the population density seems to be a lot higher than anywhere in Asia. And since that area is protected, it will not be cleared for farming and conservationists are working hard to keep it that way. The piping plover doesn't have it easy. As you might know, this bird nests on open beaches and has one of the highest mortality rates with only 25% of fledglings making it into adulthood. Between feral cats, foxes, uh, habitat loss and careless humans, this poor little bird has to fight every step of the way. But for the first time in 50 years, 
two breeding pairs have hatched four chicks on the shores of Lake Ontario. There are only 76 breeding pairs remaining around the Great Lakes. And the problem with these ones is that they were hatched 300 feet away from a channel between Sandy Pond and uh, Lake Ontario. And that channel needs to be dredged regularly to let boats pass. But since the plovers started nesting there, all dredging was stopped because the birds are protected. And that actually has affected tourism and local businesses. So so several appeals have been sent to federal agencies to allow the dredging to continue again. Uh, no permits have been issued uh, just yet and Audubon is actually working really hard to raise awareness and make sure that no dredging starts again until the chicks have grown up enough and left the nest. All right, that's it, that's all for today. Again, if you're looking for a present for your wife, daughter, your neighbor, your girlfriend, please consider buying some natural, eco-friendly makeup. And our photo contest, the Tyrant Flycatcher family is still open. Please don't forget to write the name of the birds that you submit. Take care, everyone. I'll catch you in two weeks.